all right. Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to get started. So um, can I ask everyone to take a seat? How are y'all doing tonight? Great. Awesome. Awesome. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out to today's book talk, Palestine, Israel, and the U.S. Empire. My name is Riley Park. I am a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Um, I've been a member since 2019. Um, and I will be, oh, oh, I'm a graduate student at UND, and I will be your host and MC for tonight. <laughs> so I joined the party in 2019. Um, before then, I had done some organizing um, on my college campus. I went to IUI, then IEPUI, um, <laughs> and I, you know, was realizing at that time, um, you know, there was very limited organizing that was happening on campus. There was some. Um, Obviously not to what it is today, um, but at that time there was just you know very few opportunities to get involved in organizing, and so I wanted to get more involved. Wanted something that was more grounded in the community and among working class people, and also uh, with people around the world. So um, you know I looked up the party, knew a couple people who who were in the party, um, and just went, um, signed up, um, went to my, the first lib forum that we had, and yeah, the rest is history, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, so, tonight. So, we're, li we're living in a cr at a critical and unprecedented uh, time at this moment. We are approaching the eighth month mark since the start of the genocide in Hazza by the Zionist colonial occupation. Over 3,500 Palestinians have been murdered and over 81,000 have been wounded. Entire neighborhoods, buildings, universities, and, host and hospitals have been, have been destroyed and airstrikes <coughs> with the United States government being the primary funder and supplier of money, weapons, and military equipment. Um, this, uh, this past month, the occupation began its ground invasion of Rafa. And this past weekend, the IOF bombed a tent camp at Tel al Sultan. This level of brutality and barbarism is, is, is the way that the Zionist occupation operates. We've also seen a steadfastness of the Palestinian resistance forces, their building of coalitions, and their commitment to national liberation. Here in the U.S., the movement for Palestine has grown and gained momentum throughout the months. The student movement has seen hundreds of thousands pour into the streets and campuses to, in their demands for their universities to disclose their financial and academic holdings to the Zionist occupation and to divest away from the occupation and war manufacturers. It is important for us at this critical junction, uh, junction to understand the past. Um, the present and the future. That is why we're here tonight to have this critical conversation. Um, tonight, I would like to introduce Richard Becker, who is the Western Regional Coordinator for the I Answer Act Now to Stop War and Then Racism Coalition. He is the author of Palestine, Israel, and the U.S. Empire, <coughs> excuse me, as well as Myth of Democracy and the Rule of um, the, uh, the role of banks. But before we jump into that, I want to introduce Noah, um, who's gonna talk about the Lib Center. We are a member org and a founding org of the Lib Center. So I wanna bring up Noah to the stage. Thank you, comrade. Uh, and thank you for that introduction. My name is Noah Leidinger. I'm an organizer and educator in the public schools of Indianapolis. I'm an organizer here with the Liberation Center, and I'm one of the founding members of the Indianapolis Party for Socialism and Liberation. I first started organizing with PSL right after the election of Donald Trump as president, 
And it's very uh, energizing to see how the energy has not subsided with the election of Genocide Joe. The Indianapolis Liberation Center was first founded in January 2021 in a cramped closet in the A&P building. We recently celebrated our first six months of our city's new liberated organizing space right here. The center was founded to serve as an online and physical community hub dedicated to advancing the causes of all oppressed and exploited people in Indianapolis and beyond by forging unity and working to overcome the divisions imposed on us by the oppressing classes. Our fundamental premise has always been that collaboration and cooperation rather than competition and division are the key ingredients for making social transformation. That's what history has proven. It is difficult but rewarding work and it is the only way that oppressed people have ever won. Since our move here, we have doubled our member organizations or the groups that rent space or offices here in the center to conduct their work, including Arte Mexicano in Indiana, whose uh, office you can see there, the gallery back there, Free Shaka Shakur, Focus Abolitionist Reentry, Focus Families Initiative, the Indiana Black Librarians Network, and IDOC Watch. They join Hope Packages, Answer Indiana, and the Party for Socialism and Liberation as the groups that founded this space. We also maintain IndieLiberationCenter.org, which posts regular original news and analysis, official statements, and more. None of us are paid for this work, and in fact, we pay to work here. The Liberation Center is completely community funded. Being truly politically independent requires being truly financially independent. We don't seek large grants or corporate sponsors, and we exist as a 501c4. This is why Dr. Terry Jett, former member of the Indianapolis Public Library Board, sees the center as the place to go when elected officials are not responsive to the people. Dr. Jett describes us as a courageous collective group of organizations and people who are not afraid to show up and demand solutions that represent the consciousness and values of the community. Please consider making a financial sacrifice by donating directly to the center using the QR codes around the room or by visiting the donation link at our website, uh -huh. liberationcenter.org. As individuals and organizations, we don't take credit for our center's ability to survive and thrive in this beautiful space that we continue to build together. Instead, we attributed success to the spirit and resilience of the people of Indianapolis. We didn't create that, but we took the risk necessary to amplify it by providing a physical space for different sectors of the community to meet, gather, work, and discuss. If you like what you see here tonight, Consider becoming a volunteer with the center by talking to any of our volunteers tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, comrade. Yes. Um, so I'm going to pass these uh, sticky notes around. Um, if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, uh, please write these down on these sticky notes, and uh, we'll get to uh, we'll. we'll um, We'll get to them uh, during the Q&A session. All right, so I want to uh, please give a round of applause to Richard Becker. Uh, thank you very much, Riley. And it's great to see everyone here. And it's the first time I've been in Indianapolis. So I'm always glad to be wherever I can be and really understand more and more of this enormous country. And it is an enormous country. Um, so uh, how many people here were at the Detroit conference this past weekend? It was amazing. It was really an amazing conference attended by close to 2,000 people. I've been in a lot of conferences for a long time going back to the Vietnam War and Civil Rights and Black Liberation Movement. But that was, I've never seen a conference like that. Uh, and the energy uh, of the conference was really something. And if you have a chance to, to see it, if you haven't already, um, you can find it. You know, you can, you can see the, uh, I think you can find it, is it YouTube? Where is it so it's definitely worth taking a look at. Uh, so this is the book, uh, Palestine, Israel, and the U.S. Empire, which we just, uh, well, 
it wasn't we, the 1804 books we published. It was first published in 2009 by Liberation Publications. Uh, but Liberation Publications merged with 1804 books uh, recently, and 1804 uh, published the, the, the new version of the book, which is updated, it has a chapter, an introduction, updated chronology. It's a book that was, it's not an academic book. It's a, it's a book that's written for people uh, who are interested in finding out about this issue or who are already active, but would like more of the basic information about and. Also, it, it intends and its, it's, uh, its aim is to show through the words of the Zionists themselves and the leaders of the state of Israel what they had intended from the beginning, uh, which was really to uh, not only to settle in Palestine, but to create an exclusivist state, to exclude a, a, a state that displaced they called it transfer at one time, displace the population, the indigenous population, and to take their place, uh, and, and to take the country, in fact. Uh, and uh, this is what we document in the book. You know, I want to talk a little bit about the history. Uh, the, the, this is, we're not talking about something age old conflicts or something like that. You know, that's. That's more the mythology and uh, it's been presented in which most people unfortunately in the US believe because they've been bombarded with this propaganda all these years and it's, this is thousands of years of struggle between Arabs and Jews or Jews and Muslims and Christians. None of that is true. None of that is true at all. Uh, the, I mean, that, it's not that there haven't been some conflicts at some time, but the Zionist movement that we're talking about the modern Zionist movement is not a religion. It's not about religion, and we very much, you know, it's very important to separate the religion Judaism from Zionism, which is a political movement that was founded by people who are, for the most part, uh, atheists themselves. They did, they were not. They didn't believe in any religion, uh, but they did believe that they could create. They they could uh, try to resolve the crisis that existed. The contradiction in, that existed between Jewish uh, Jewish people, in particularly in Europe, but also in the Americas, uh, and the dominant societies. Uh, this was a very contradictory movement from the beginning, in that on the one hand, it was addressing a very real, uh, very real anti-Semitism, particularly in Europe in the old Russian Empire, uh, but also in the Americas. Uh, but at the same time, it was from the beginning a colonial, a Euro another European colonial movement. And how do we know that? The leaders said so. The first leader was Theodore Herzl. Herzl has a, an infamous letter uh, to Cecil Rhodes, who was the ar British architect of, uh, of uh, colonialism in Africa. And he says, why do I write to you? This isn't about Africa, it's about Asia Minor. Uh, as he called it, he said, because it's something colonial. And so you have this, this contradiction. And another very big contradiction, in fact, in a certain way, an even bigger contradiction for the Zionist movement was that it didn't have an army or a navy. And it didn't have any land on which it could to build an army or a navy. And this created a situation which is relevant to us right now until today. And that is that it had to find a sponsor. I mean, this, this is, made it unlike any other colonial movement where the colonizers came, whether they were coming from the Netherlands to Indonesia, or the French so much of Africa, or the British so much of Africa. Uh, this, the settlement that happened here, uh, the, the, the way it was, the state was created and so forth. <clears throat> but there was no, they had no, because they had no army and no navy, they had no means of organized violence without which colonialism cannot take place. Colonialism is never a peaceful process. Uh, it's, a, it's a process of violence. And so they had to find a sponsor. And so they went, in the first 20 years, a large part of uh, what followed the first World Zionist Congress in 1897, which is really uh, announced, the, the Zionist movement, had, you could perhaps say it started 15 or 20 years earlier, but it really announced itself to the world at the First World Zionist Congress 
in Basel, Switzerland in, uh, in 1897. And over the next 20 years, they sought their leaders, first Herzl before he died, and then Chaim Weizmann, who succeeded him, to get one of the European empires to support their project, to sponsor them, in fact. And they went to the Russian Empire, which was the home of the worst pogroms and violence against Jewish people. They went to the German Empire. They went to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and the Ottoman Empire was then uh, included most of what is considered the modern Middle East. Uh, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, Egypt. Um, uh, so th they controlled, that was uh, 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 who controlled that, uh, that area. Uh, but the, who finally sponsored them was the British Empire. And here's the British Empire that, you know, spanned the world. They said the sun never set on the British Empire because it was so far flung. And the British Empire decided to do it. How many people know what the Balfour Declaration was over here? Most people. The Balfour, so the Balfour Declaration is the, uh, was a statement on November 2nd, a letter on November 2nd, 1917, so 20 years after the World Zionist Congress, they, they find their sponsor, and the Foreign Secretary of the British Empire, uh, Bell, Arthur Belfort, issues this letter, and the letter says that His Majesty's government looks with favor upon the creation of a national home, a quote-unquote national home in Palestine, not to prejudice the rights of any non-Jewish people who are there. Which in and of itself is a highly chauvinistic statement in that the Jewish population of Palestine was then 8%. Uh, that court non-Jewish population was 92%, but as a, one Israeli, I don't know, one Palestinian historian that we quote said, uh, it was a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a absolute pretense to not say, have the word Arab there anywhere, just the non-Jewish, non in other words, the non-European. And meaning, in the same way, this was, this was a, again, illustrative of the view of all of the colonizer projects who did not recognize <coughs> that the colonized people had any rights at all. It's a very similar, you could, you could take the Dred Scott case that said, you know, that whites had no uh, rights that black people were, uh, that, that black people had no rights that whites were bound to respect. It was the same thing. It's the same thing in, in, in every case. So this was, this was 1917. And what's really interesting and really left out, and one of the things we included in the book, is that what happened at that time was very, very much the creation, the, pre, the, the prelude to the, the creation of the modern Middle East. Uh, this is something, by the way, that if you go, I mean, this is my own experience here, if you in Damascus, if you talk to a cab driver, they can tell you about this. They know what the Belfort Declaration is, and they know what the Sykes-Pico Treaty is, or Accord. People know what the Sykes-Pico, anybody know? So Sykes-Pico, yeah, Sykes-Pico, and uh, very coincidentally, uh, and, and very appropriately, on November 2nd, 1917, the Belfort Declaration is issued by the British government. Five days later was the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. And the significance of that, how that relates to this is that in 1915, when the World War I started, the British had sent this guy named T.E. Lawrence, romanticized in the movie Lawrence of Arabia, uh, to the, meet with the emerging Arab national movement inside the Ottoman Empire uh, and, and, and uh, said to them, if you fight on our side against the Ottoman Empire in World War I, because Britain and the Ottoman Empire were on op opposite sides, then we will support your right to an independent state in, uh, in, the, in the Middle East when the war is over. The next year, 1916, they had all met the British, French, and Russian delegates and talked about how they would cut up the Ottoman Empire when they defeated it in, in, in the war. So in 1917, as I said, it comes the Belfort Declaration on November 2nd, 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution on November 7th, 1917, and one of the first things that the British, the, the new Russian, uh, uh, the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs uh, said, the, the Commissar of Foreign Affairs did, was publish the Sykes-Picot Treaty. It had been a secret treaty, so 
the world finds out, and particularly the people in the Arab world find out, when, within a couple of weeks that not only was that promise a lie about independence, but uh, the, the, the Arab world, and particularly the Middle East part, is being cut up among uh, the British and the French, and the Russians had their part, but the Russian, the new Russian revolutionary government said, this is what, here, this is what the imperialists are really doing behind your back. We want no part of this. We renounce annexation. Uh, but, you know, within a few weeks, this is, they find out, not only has the <coughs> Middle East been ch chopped up among the, the carved up among the, the imperialists, but that a new, the, the British imperialists have promised a new, in the heart of the Arab world to create a new European colonial state. So this is this is the foundation, you know, and, and I'm dwelling on it a little bit because this is really how uh, the countries that uh, the, the borders are drawn of Iraq, of Jordan, of Palestine, of Lebanon, uh, and and uh, and there were rebellions then that went, that broke out afterwards, rebellions all over the region in 1919 and 1920, uh, taking seriously <coughs> the creation of a new state. Delegates gathered a few months after the end of World War I in Damascus. They created a new state. Uh, they called it the Arab, uh, the Arab Syrian Kingdom. It had a king, but it was a, with a parliament, a monarchy, with a, a constitutional monarchy. And in 1921, the French troops came in and, and drowned it in blood. And they took over. And the British took over the other. So, this is the beginning of, uh, this is the beginning of, uh, this is 100 years ago, it's not 3,000 years ago, it's not about any of that, that that people in this country have been taught about, you know, this is some kind of endless antagonism between peoples, no, this is imperialism and colonialism, and that's how uh, the, the, the foundation was laid for what we uh, see today. So without that, Without the British sponsorship, the Zionist project was dead in the water. It never could have run anywhere. <laughs> because, it, as I said, it had no army, it had no navy, and no means by which to create one. Uh, if you don't have any land, you don't have any territory, you can't do it. But they did. They, so it went from 8% of the population in 1917 was uh, Jewish population. And by the way, most of the Jewish population, that 8%, was completely opposed to the Zionist project. They were, uh, a majority of the, of the Jewish population that were Orthodox Jews who considered this to be a disaster that would create a great conflict, uh, and they were against it. So, but the door was open, and the settlers poured in. Over the next 30 years, uh, it went from 8% to about 35% of the population uh, were settlers. Of course, in the, in the, in, there was conflict after conflict after conflict. There's a, a we talk about in the book the uh, Great Arab Revolt of 1936 to 39. Uh, there was a general strike that lasted six months and guerrilla warfare that lasted two and a half years. But it too was crushed by the, by the British and the Zionists working together. It was a revolution that attempted to throw out the British and, and end the, the Zionist project uh, and to be able to, you know, for the Palestinians to have self determination. And World War II, of course, comes the Holocaust and mass murder of Jewish people, mass murder of Slavic people, uh, 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 annihilation of two thirds of Roma people, uh, the trade unionists, uh, uh, communists, socialists, the, uh, the Nazis tried to wipe out the disabled population wherever they were. I mean, so it was a horrible thing. Of course, it was like indescribably horrible. It was killing on an industrial scale. And I, and I, I think this is important to point out that there's, a, there's kind of a myth that was developed afterwards that the US leaders were all very sympathetic to what was happening to Jewish people and other people, but particularly Jewish people. But in reality, before the war actually started, uh, the U.S. government had turned down a bill to uh, uh, allow 20,000 uh, uh, Jewish children who were refugees from Nazi Germany into the U.S. That was turned down. 
And when I say it was killing on an industrial scale that went on during the war, it, it, the main industry that facilitated killing on such a scale was the uh, uh, the main uh, was the railroads, because people were being brought in in boxcars into the camps and then, you know, in many cases immediately massacred in the, in the gas chambers. So there was an appeal made to the British and to the U.S. who were flying thousands of air missions a week at that time, bombing Germany and other parts of Europe, to bomb the rail lines and slow down at least the, the rate of killing, and they refused to do it. When the war was over, though, uh, and the, a big struggle happened in the U.S., and this is after 1945 and at the end of World War II, over whether or not to support the creation of the State of Israel. And there was a big debate about it. But once they decided that the, they were going to support it, then what followed was uh, this contention that the US leadership had been all sympathetic with what was happening to the Jewish people. In fact, the only member, a Jewish member of the parliament, of the, of the cabinet, I mean, of the Roosevelt's cabinet, Henry Morgenthau, who was the Secretary of the Treasury, wrote, had, had a, a document written that uh, we accused the State Department and others in the U.S. government of making the situation even worse for people who were suffering this mass genocide that was going on. But they decided to support it, and in 1947, at the United Nations, on November 29th, 1947, there was a vote, a very close vote, uh, an illegal vote, I would say, an illegitimate vote uh, at the United Nations to create to divide Palestine, where the British were pulling out, to divide Palestine into two parts. 55% would go to become a, a, the Zionist state, <clears throat> the 44% the Palestinian state, Arab state, 1% was supposed to be uh, in the international district around, the, uh, around Jerusalem. Uh, and what made it illegal and illegitimate is there was no consultation at all with the, uh, uh, the Palestinians. Uh, and um, and war broke out immediately afterwards. The Palestinians were in a weakened state because of what had happened at the end of the Great Arab Revolt of 1936 to 39. But they still there was a battle that was raging. The, the the Zionist side had much more in the way of arms, money, funding, uh, training, military training, uh, and. Uh, had fought with the British, had been allied with the British in the, in the war that had happened. Uh, and, and in the early stages of this, uh, and this is relevant to us today, is, is that the battles would take place uh, inside Palestine, and in most cases, uh, the Zionist side would win, their military would win, but not all of the time. But even when they won, they were not satisfied. And a couple of months into the war, in February of 1948, the vote at the UN had been in, in 19, November 1947, they came up with a new battle plan for the war. And it, the, it was called Plan Dalet. And Dalet is the fourth letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So there have been three plans before. But this was a new plan, and it announced itself to the world on, on April 9th, 1948 with the massacre at Deir Yassin, a small village on the outskirts of uh, Jerusalem where um, nearly the entire population was wiped out. And this was a sign of what the new strategy was. And the new strategy was because of the fact that the Zionist leaders were not satisfied with people that were just winning battles. They wanted the population out. About 600,000 Palestinian Arabs lived inside the state that was supposed to become the Zionist state. And they didn't want them. They wanted to, to drive them out. And so the area scene was the first of many, many massacres that followed. Ilan Pape, who is a famous uh, a progressive Israeli historian, has said that there could have been, that there were dozens, perhaps as many as 200 massacres that then followed over the next few months. And the idea was to terrorize the population into leaving. There was a myth that was circulated for many years in the United States that the reason that the Palestinians who left, half of the Palestinian population, uh, that they left because the Arab 
rulers or kings told them to leave and they could come back later. But, but they're mostly farmers, 85% were probably farmers. You can't leave the farm. Uh, that's why farming is so hard because you have to do it day and night, day and night, you can't stop. Uh, and, and so that was just another myth. The, the real point of uh, design and strategy was to make it, to compel the population to leave. And the only way you could do that was by threatening their lives. So uh, after many massacres, a lot of the population would, had to flee, had to, was driven out. And, and uh, I should say that in, in 1948, that same year that the state of Israel was declared, that was, would have been on May 14th, 1948. In December of that year, the UN re uh, passed a resolution that said all the Palestinians who had left had to be allowed to return and had to be comp had to be compensated for their losses. And down today, not one has ever been. Uh, so that that was really a gross violation of international law, which took place. But neither the U.S. nor Israel, and Israel because of the protection of the U.S have to answer for their violations of international So the British left in 1948, and at the first, in the first few years afterwards, the main sponsor uh, shifted, and it wasn't to the United States right away, it was to France. French the French imperialists collaborated with the Israelis, and then later with the British to try to overthrow the government in a war of 1948. Uh, and uh, the French um, gave Israel weaponry, provided weaponry, but they also provided them with the atomic bomb. That's how Israel became an atomic bomb power, was uh, in the early 1960s, and that was from the means and technology and material were provided by France. Until 1969, when Israel launched another war, uh, and, and this time when we this was a myth of the time that they were threatened and they had to act because they were going to be surrounded by the Arab countries and so and so on and so forth. Later, the leaders said no. That they didn't say at the time, but ten years, twenty years later, they would say, "Oh yeah, you know how we said that? Well, it wasn't really true." <laughs> but that's when they conquered the West Bank and the Ga and Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula, which went back to Egypt later, the Golan Heights, which were part of Syria. Uh, East Jerusalem. That's how the current configuration came into being. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, from the very beginning, keeping in, in, in line with what the policy and the perspective always was, from the very first cabinet meetings that happened in the Six Day War of 1967, when, when all of that happened, uh, the discussion in the Israeli cabinet was how can we annex the land but not the people who are on the land. How can we get the people out who are on the land? Uh, so, it, well, but it was 1967, that 1967 war, which there was a surprise attack by Israel on Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, destroyed their air forces, uh, set back the Arab national movement tremendously, and I uh, quoted in the book, Gerald Ford, who was uh, then, uh, he'd later become president, but he was then the, uh, House Minority Leader, and he said, Israel has really done the job that we needed. Uh, and we're very happy. And it's after that that the US becomes the main sponsor. And it, has, uh, and it was the next year Nixon was elected. And under Nixon, who was a terrible anti-Semite, hated Jewish people, really hated Jewish people, and didn't make much of a secret about it. He, it was under his government that the millions of dollars in USA that were going to Israel became billions of dollars, and have continued to be billions of dollars down till today. So these are like, uh, there's these, these continuities. One is that from the beginning, the Zionist state could not exist, could not come into being without the sponsorship of one or another of the great powers, quote unquote great. And uh, first that was, uh, Britain for many years, which really set the stage. Then it was France. And down till today, it's the United States. Israel can't really be there by itself. It could never have come into being without that sponsorship. And today, uh, it's backing by the 
the world's number one military power. I mean, those bombs are all made in the U.S. The, the planes, the high-tech planes come from the U.S. And more importantly, in a certain way, Israel would be completely isolated in the world today if it did not have the backing of the U.S. And you can see how narrow that is by the fact that, you know, the, in last October when the vote happened again, <coughs> the blockade of Cuba, it was 182 to 2. Guess who the two were? It was Israel and the United States. And, uh, and, and so it's, it's the, those who are realistic about this know that that support from one of the great powers is at, in, in Israel, they know this. That, that, that's absolutely essential. Uh, so the, uh, to say a couple other things, one is that, um, is to say something about why does the U.S. do it? Why do they give all the support to Israel? Israel, the standard of living for a lot of Israelis is better than a lot of people in the United States. Uh, they have a health care system. Uh, <laughs> we don't. But we, the money keeps pouring in, billions of dollars a year keeps pouring in. Uh, the standard of living um, in the education system, I mean, so it's not because, and it's certainly not for the, because there's some, you know, shared values or something, although they do maybe do this with some weird shared values. But it's, it's because Israel, and it's not, and, and I wouldn't discount the, uh, the Israel lobby, the pro-Israel lobby, who, you know, because our great Congress people, you know, if you wave money in front of them, they'll <laughs> call you anywhere. Uh, so we don't want to say that's unimportant. But there's something more fundamental, and that is that Israel has done a great deal, just like Gerald Ford said about the 1967 war, in the world, and particularly things that the U.S. government didn't want to be identified with itself. So for instance, in 1983, it became known, uh, uh, quite openly known, that the Guatemalan army was committing genocide against the Mayan population of Guatemala. And that was a time when there was a revolution going on in El Salvador, there had been a revolution in Nicaragua, uh, and, but, but the funding, direct funding from the U.S. was cut off to Guatemala. And who stepped in to become the trainers and the armors of the Guatemalan military? Israel did. In 1979, when Israel was really, really strongly supporting the South African apartheid regime, being an apartheid regime also themselves, <laughs> but they, 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 uh, they uh, uh, gave, South Africa, the atomic bomb. The way the French had given them the atomic bomb, they exploded an atomic bomb in the South Atlantic in 1979. And South Africa became uh, a nuclear weapons power. They, when, the, when the ANC took over, they, they got rid of the nuclear weapons. But why did the US want that to be so, uh, South Africa to be strong? It wasn't just the profit that could be made. It was also that South Africa was kind of like Israel, but in southern sub-Saharan Africa, responsible for putting down the revolutionary movements in Angola and Mozambique and Namibia uh, in the interest of imperialism. So, and and uh, but nowhere has Israel's impact been greater and more neg in a more negative way than in the Middle East itself. So, as I mentioned, the 1967 war. Uh, in 19, in, way back in, in 1956, when Israel uh, initiated together with France and then they brought in Britain an attempt to overthrow the, a, a war that they launched to overthrow the government of Nasser, who was the, the most prominent Arab leader of the time. And then in 67, and then in 1982, <coughs> the invasion of, of, uh, of Lebanon. They invaded Lebanon in 1982 and occupied much of the country uh, until the year 2000, the 18 years, and so they were driven out by the Lebanese resistance, uh, who are called terrorists, of course, here. Um, so, and, and uh, development, all development in the region has been, has been uh, really hampered 
and the, and and oftentimes derailed by the fact that you have to. They, everybody has to think, well, what will Israel do, or what will the U.S. have Israel do to us mm -hmm. if we take some radical step, if we nationalize our resources? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's it's had a profoundly uh, destabilizing uh, impact and, and de-developing impact on the yeah, Middle East yeah. region. Uh, it's really, it's, it, it's really uh, like they have to, uh, <clears throat> they have to really uh, c constantly consider <coughs> this because you see, like today, um, the U.S. bombs Damascus on a daily basis, or, or they they do what they, what, you know, and somehow they, that's okay for them to, to do that. No international law is, is brought out, so. It's, a, it's been an investment by the U.S. It's now hundreds of billions of dollars have brought to Israel. Israel is a sm rel relatively small country, but it's a very large military base. Uh, and it's a, it's a military base that's not floating or something like that. It's, it's there. So the, you know, and, and what makes Israel really different than the other governments of the region, even if they're very reactionary and, and pro-imperialist, um, <coughs> or pro-Israel and want to make, you know, like the Abraham Accords, as they were called in the 2018, of these agreements that the Trump administration was sponsoring to try to isolate Israel, uh, to isolate the Palestinians. Uh, those, the, uh, the, the um, I want to say the, uh, the oh, so if you take one country, there's a, a number of these countries that are, have the family monarchies. I mean, you also have this question, what, what are, what's going on with absolute family <coughs> monarchies in 2024? I mean, the, uh, Saudi Arabia is the, the Arabia of the Al Saud family. You know, and Bahrain has the U.S. fifth fleet there uh, in, the, in the Gulf. And, <clears throat> and it's, again, a very reactionary government. They smashed the people's movement. Uh, and they can make all kinds of agreements, like the government, the king can make, uh, uh, the emir from uh, Bahrain can make agreements with Israel and uh, agreements with Washington. But if the people of Bahrain had their way, they'd overthrow the government. And they'd overthrow the government and they would end, end these accords with, uh, with Israel and with the US. Uh, so that's why, from the US point of view, from Washington's point of view, they are not reliable. They can ally themselves, they can protest all they want about how much devoted they are to the, to the imperialists and how they want to be friends with Israel. But underneath, the population means that it's from Washington's point of view, it's not stable. Israel is different. Israel and the Israeli leaders, and we talk about some of this in the book, and also uh, in a, one of the appendices in the book is called Israel Base of Western Imperialism that was written in, in uh, 1968 by a great uh, Egyptian historian named uh, Abdel Wahab al masiri And he shows how, in, in this essay how the leaders of what would become the State of Israel in Palestine wanted to make it clear that they were not of the region, that they, that they were from the Occident, not the Orient, and the Orient was terrible, meaning the Occident meaning Europe and, and the U.S. And, and so they have considered themselves to be in the region, but not of the region, and really in, in, in contradiction and hostility with the region. So, you know, uh, just a, and a, a, the last thing I'll say about, uh, uh, we're gonna, I hope we can have some real discussion, is that in his, in his essay, uh, Al-Masiri, uh, was teaching at Rutgers University. This was written back in 1969, was the, the, this pamphlet. And he says, uh, he's teaching at Rutgers, and he had a student who was from Israel who was part of the Peace Party of Manhattan. They don't have bother with having peace parties or attending peace parties anymore. But at the time they did. And, and, uh, and Amasiri says to the student, why is Israel supporting the U.S. in Vietnam? Because they, were, they weren't sending troops, but they were doing all kinds of things to show support. And the student replies, Israel must defend itself. 
Which is worth thinking about for a minute. Like, was Vietnam about to attack <laughs> Israel? I mean, I don't think so. It's really when you really think about it, we have to be with our sponsor, is what it really is an expression of. Is that, you know, that understanding that this is essential to, to Israel's uh, very existence. And it has been since the very beginning. And the one other thing I, I, I want to say is about continuity, and there's a lot of continuities, but that terror that was used to ex, uh, expel the Palestinian population, so much of it, 750,000 people in 1948-49, another 300,000 in what's called Al-Naqsa. The first one is called Al-Naqba. But Al-Naqsa was in 1967, when the 67 war happened, and 300,000 Palestinians more were driven out and into refugee camps. And today we see the terror <coughs> that continues. I mean, why is it not called terrorism when a, 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 a pilot flies a plane, a high-tech plane, and drops 2,000 pound bombs on the apartment buildings that are mostly inhabited by the refugees from the earlier periods, from 1948 and 1967, and faces no air defenses at all. They have no air defenses to fight against high, those high-tech planes. But that's not that, that's never called terrorism. Mm -hmm. Why not? It's a you know again that, it's a whole different subject, which is the the language of imperialism that we have to dissect all the time and, and take apart. So, uh, as Riley said at the beginning, you know we take inspiration from the steadfastness of the Palestinians in the face of these terrible odds against them and the fact that they face an alliance not only of the Zionists but also of the reactionary Arab governments and first and foremost of US imperialism. But they continue the struggle, they refuse to give up. Uh, and we should take a page from their book, particularly living where we live in the country that makes all of this possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Please give it up. For, uh, please give another round of applause for Richard. Okay. So I think we have some questions. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So, um, could you talk more about the Oslo Accords and the prospects for, or the prospects or lack thereof, for a quote unquote two state solution? Well, the, I actually read the Oslo Accords when I came out, which is a grueling exercise. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, there was a, there, there was supposed to be the Oslo Accords were the culmination of a period of negotiations that had started in 1991, and the reason that the negotiations had started was because of the first intifada. The intifada that had begun in 1987 and was still continuing at that time. And it was like a giant, it was like a giant national strike too. It was like there was a situation of kind of dual power there between the Israeli army and the Palestinian resistance in the West Bank and Gaza. And, um, and so that led to this, and it was, it was viewed by the Palestinian left as very bad the negotiations and that they were, that there, were to be, that there was a kind of surrender that was going on or the way that they viewed it. So the Oslo Accords is like this huge document that had, talks about every little detail of how um, all imports and exports would still, the, the, it was supposed to be a Palestinian state, but they would not have control over their borders. They wouldn't really have control over their airspace. They wouldn't have control over their water. But there was supposed to be within five years uh, a resolution, a final settlement, and and the and the, um, the PLO leaders who negotiated it, and and many people uh, believed that that by the end of five years there would be another state, there would be a Palestinian state with all the limitations that it would have. Uh, the the Israelis didn't have, never intended that. 
that they have read to be the outcome. Um, and now, as you know, they they ritualistically talk about a two state. Biden talks about it, and Lincoln, and, and all that. But where is it? I mean, where would it be? There's so many settlements. There's like 700,000 settlers living under their own system with their own roads and control of the water, control of, the, of all the resources. Um, so it's 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 always been it, it caused a big rift in the Palestinian movement, which became an emerged as an independent movement after the '67 war. That's when the uh, the, the, there was a PLO before, but it was really, it wasn't really, now it became real. There was Fatah, there was the Popular Front, there was the Democratic Front. At the beginning, it was really those three, and maybe some other small organizations. But, uh, and, and they were all uh, called for one state, democratic rights for all people, and they would fight for it. In 74, though, the Fatah, and supported by the Democratic Front, accepted the idea of a two state. Um, today, and if you, if you get the, the book, you can read the comments of Ahmed Sadat, who was the leader of the PFLP. This is an interview he did quite a long time ago, but he commands the position of the Popular Front. Uh, and Hamas itself, at this point, would accept as a temporary measure uh, a, 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 to a state, a state with but not with the idea that that's the end of the struggle. Uh, and, and so, like they have offered, Hamas has, uh, has said they would accept a 50-year hudna, which means a truce in exchange for the creation of a West Bank Gaza state. But I don't think, I think that that's a, a political position that they take. I don't think anybody really thinks that it's possible at this point. And it's a, a thorough going, uh, as we've talked about in the book in some detail, uh, it's an apartheid state. It has to, I mean, the idea of defending an apartheid state, well, I mean, what are you defending? Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, you know, th there's been, as we point out in the book, there's now dozens of, of, of inter Palestinian, Israeli, US, international human rights organizations that have produced reports in great detail about the apartheid character of, this, of the state. It's an apartheid state in, in, in every respect. And, but yet, back in October, I think it was, or early November, our great House of Representatives passed a resolution 412 to 9 that Israel's not an apartheid state. So it's not an apartheid state. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah, and that, you know, maybe they want to pass a resolution that. Uh, the uh, sun rotates around the earth. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> you can do anything, you can vote anything. But um, I think that uh, clearly it is, and for those who keep talking about, like, you know, it's a democratic or... No, and the, uh, the, you have to also say that the fascist element, and really fascist, I mean, not, I'm not using the word hyperbolically, but the, the fascist elements in, in Israel are on the rise. They are, they dominate the government. The government, if, if they said if, if, if Rafa is an attack, they're withdrawing from the government. They said it's two weeks ago. And if they do, then the government collapses. So uh, they, have a, they have a grip on, on that government. And, and, uh, and, and I'm not exaggerating when I say they're fascists. The guy, Ben Gavir, who's the Minister of National Security now, had on his living room wall uh, a picture of Baruch Goldstein. Baruch Goldstein, in uh, 19, I think it was 1995, went into the, uh, uh, the Ibrahimi Mosque in Hebron and uh, murdered 29 people and wounded 120. And he he had so Ben Gavir has his picture on the wall. And they told him in 1919, well, I mean 2019, if you want to run for office, you got to take down that picture. And he was like, oh, okay, I'll take down the picture. You know. I moved it to another room. Uh, so, I mean, he's, that, that's who these people are. And they're also in charge of the prisons now, which is very terrible because they're really like doing real, like unbelievable uh, kind of continuous torture of the Palestinian for political prisoners. Okay, so another question is from your view. 
What is our role in at this moment as answer members or concerned citizens or social justice advocates to disrupt uh, the U.S. government's persistent investment in this genocide? Yeah, that's a good question, and there's a lot to that question, I think, a lot to it. <clears throat> I think what we need to do is broaden this movement. We need to make the movement bigger. I mean, there's all different kinds of things that people are doing. The encampments, like, you know, they kind of came out of nowhere, and they were a surprise. And, and, and then when they got repressed, there was even more of a surprise that there were campuses everywhere that have encampments. And, so uh, the creativity is needed, uh, but really, really what the government is, is worried about uh, is that this movement is, is a big surprise to them. It's a, no one imagined that this, this was going to emerge. And I, I know, you know Biden, I'm sure, uh, thought that what happened on October 7th would lead to, make him more popular to be proclaiming how pro-Israeli he was. Instead, something very different happened. And this uh, explosion of anger, and it's really, I think, part of an accumulation over the years of there have been many, many movements that have emerged. And, you know, anti Iraq war, uh, the immigrant rights in, in 2006, uh, Occupy Wall Street, the Black Lives Matter movement, first, the manifest, uh, how it manifested itself in Ferguson which was huge, and also where there began to be a connection being made between the Palestinian struggle and, and Palestinians sending a, like advice on how to deal with different kinds of poison, you know, get the gas and so forth. And then the George Floyd movement, which was until now is the biggest movement in US history, biggest protest movement in US history, where there were at least 5,000 cities and towns that had Demonstrations, and I think the Palestine movement also connected there again, and then you know, and then this, and also in between other things that happened, like the the Bernie Sanders campaign. The Bernie Sanders campaign is very interesting because uh, it it uh, I, I see a lot of, uh, of uh, the evidence of this as like you know uh, what's his name. Uh, Anderson Vanderbilt Cooper, <laughs> which <should> always <laughs> He thought he was going to knock, back in 2016 in the first Democratic Party debate, he thought he was going to uh, knock Sanders out of the race. And he said to him, and right at the beginning, he said to him, you say you're a socialist. No socialist can be president of the United States. And what do you mean by socialism? So Bernie told him what he meant by socialism, which is Bernie's version of it. Uh, I mean, it's things that we agree with, but he said, I'm not for nationalizing the means of production, but I'm, you know, for health care and housing and uh, forgiveness of student debt and, you know, that kind of thing. So then what happened was that socialism, instead of being knocked, instead of Bernie being knocked out and his influence, socialism became the most looked up word in in, 19, in 20, 2016, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And, and, and we, get, we see applications constantly down till today, and I mean today, uh, of people who said, how did you become a socialist? Well, it started with Bernie Sanders. <laughs> or, or it started with Bernie Sanders, and then I, I, I wanted to find out more about, so I, I started reading, and then I started reading Marx. And then they started reading Lenin, and so forth. Or you get from some people, they say, um, uh, the Bernie to Socialism Pipeline. <laughs> this, is very, this is not uncommon. Or some people just say, Bernie. And, and like you can extrapolate then, like, what, what, they, what else they mean by that. But that, it really put, it, it, it it put socialism back into the political discourse. And of course, the right wing and everybody's all denouncing it, but millions of people now consider themselves, who didn't before, and we can't give all credit to Anderson Vanderbilt. No. <laughs> <laughs> really, millions of people now consider themselves socialists who didn't, who didn't 10 years ago. So you have this ideological component of the movement which makes the movement and it, when you put together that, like I, I think of 
at, at the Detroit conference, I think about 98% of the people there were for socialism. I, I mean, that wasn't what the discussion was about. But you see in the demonstrations, the, the anti-imperialist character of the demonstrations now. And all of this is a result, I think, of the, the accumulation of experience that so many people have gone through over the years. And also just seeing the, the bankruptcy of the system. I mean, it's not only Palestine, as horrific as that's going on, but, you know, I mean, housing, the, cri the housing crisis, which is getting worse, the environmental crisis, and nothing is being done. I mean, nothing is being done at all. It, it's coming forth from the... So, the movement is also, and I, I'm saying a lot about this, but the movement has also become very hard to co-opt because it's turned against the system. It's turned against the system, and also, it's very hard to co-opt the issue of Palestine. Really, it's really something that, you know, I mean, before when it was the Iraq war, there could be a liberal opposition, but you can't, there's not a liberal opposition that really works for this one. Um, so there are two, uh, this one has two questions, so. Um, what else made uh, Theodore, Theodore Herzl uh, uh, into a Zionist? And then the second question is, why was there infighting between the Palestinian resistance groups in the 60s and 70s? I know you mentioned a little bit about Fatah and sort of the difference between the one state and the quote unquote two state solution. So was that about the differences in uh, earlier? Yeah. Why was the why was there infighting between oh uh, the, between the Palestinian resistance groups in the sixties and seventies? Yeah. Um, and what was the first question? Uh, what else made Theodore oh, oh, Theodore Herzl yeah. into a Zionist? Well, I mean Herzl uh, was a journalist. He covered a trial that took place of a, a French military officer named Dreyfus. Dreyfus was Jewish, and he was framed up on some charges and sent to Devil's Island, which is this horrific prison off the coast of South America, which the French had. And it was, he was framed up on an anti-Semitic uh, basis. And, and Herzl came, like, like, but France was considered like the most liberal society at the time. I think it, that he, that Herzl was, uh, like, or maybe he would, I think he was inclined in the direction already, but just kind of wrapped it up for him because he was like, well, France is the most liberal country, and if this can happen in France, then there's no hope for um, Jewish people in Europe. The great majority of the politically active Jewish people did not agree with Dreyfus about this. And whether they were socialist or liberal or whatever, they were for fighting for uh, equal rights inside the societies where they where they live. And they are, and mo most considered Zionism to be a reactionary ideology which would actually separate the Jewish population more rather than integrating the Jewish population. Mm -hmm. And the difference is, like, uh, in 1958, there was a, uh, the Fatah was first formed as an organization by, initiated by uh, Yasser Arafat and others. And, uh, and then there was the Arab National Movement, which the primary leader, but not only leader, was uh, George Habash and uh, Wadi Haddad and uh, Hassan Kanfani and, and others. And it was the Arab National Movement, which looked to Egypt and which had the hopes that Egypt and the, the uh, development in the Arab world would lead to the Arab armies defeating Israel and making it possible for the Palestinians to return. But at, with the 67 war, they gave up on that as an idea and uh, they, get, they uh, and formed uh, a party, popular party, which was a Marxist, and defined it as a Marxist-Leninist party. Uh, Arafat was more of representing the Palestinian bourgeoisie and, and, uh, and Habash uh, more represented the, I mean, they both, I, I don't want to overstate it because they both represented the people in the camps, the people who were stu still stuck by the hundreds of thousands in refugee camps. 
and deprived of their land and, and so forth. So for a while they collaborated, um, and it very, very, it very times it went back and forth. So in 74, they had a big falling out because of the two-state issue. In 1986, they had a reunification of the, uh, and that set the stage for the uh, Intifada that started in 87, and there was a national unified leadership which was comprised of representatives, depending on what areas people were strong, but uh, always there was PFLP, always there was FIFA, the, and the Democratic Front, there was the Palestinian Pi uh, People's Party, which was the Communist Party, they were involved. So that went on and then it broke down again. The unity broke with the, the opening of the talks with, uh, in Madrid that led to the Oslo Accord. Um, so the next question is, what are some of your other favorite books about Palestine? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot. There's a lot out there. And um, one thing I would say is that the end notes to our book lead people in the direction of like wanting to go deeper into a lot of these different subjects and, and the issue in general. So. I think that the books, there's many books by Edward Said, there's many books by uh, Rashid Khalidi, uh, and, uh, and also his father was a, a very well-known historian. Um, there's uh, the, the very good books by Ilan Pape, who I mentioned before, who's, who's an Israeli historian, not living uh, there anymore, uh, living in England now, but who's, who's, uh, whose work is very, it's, it's very useful. They're all very useful, but they, they, and his books are not real long, like The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, but it's a very, it's a very useful book. Um, and there's many, there's many others as well, but I would say, I would say those are good. There's, um, there's a historian named Avi Schleim, Schleim, S-C-H-L-A-I-M, he has good books, um, but yeah, that's that's some. But really, when you have this book, <laughs> <laughs> you can look up all those other books. Definitely. Um, so this question, so this one reads: the fundamental aspect of a state is the military, which shows that the quote-unquote two-state solution is unacceptable to Israel. That said, the heroism of Palestine, um, plus their successful armed struggle, needs our support. Does it also need the support of other military forces like Iran, Hezbollah, Yemen, etc.? Well, we've seen some of that happening. I mean, the um, uh, yeah, the base is, is the military. What what the Israelis have always insisted upon when they even talk about the two-state solution is that there has to be, a, they're okay with the Palestinians having a police force that would police, you know, revolutionaries, <laughs> but they don't want there to be a military. They, they insist that any discussion has to mean, has to be based on uh, the, uh, the, the disarmament of the Palestinians, basically. They can't have a military. So that would mean that these kind of discussions, if you combine the Oslo Accord and all the regulations about trade and commerce and everything else with not having a military, then you can really see it's not a it's not a state in the sense that any other the, uh, any other state. It's not sovereign. Mm -hmm. It can't be sovereign with those uh, with those conditions. The art history and what was the other? Oh, but the yeah. So you can see that uh, some real, some major changes are happening. Um, and, you know, Israel has such superior weaponry, but their, their, their uh, gap is closing. It's not, I mean, they're the only ones who have the atomic bomb and nuclear weapons. But you can see, like, uh, it was very interesting what happened when the, Israelis attacked the, the consulate in Damascus. Mm -hmm. They blew it up and killed some 
prominent Iranians. Uh, the consulate was attached to the embassy. It didn't hit the embassy, but it was just a coincidence that it, uh, it didn't kill the, the uh, ambassador, the Iranian ambassador to, to Damascus. And then the Iranians uh, retaliated. I mean, they fired. They, they did it in a limited way. They did it in a very limited way. And they didn't send their most modern, apparently didn't send their most modern technology. But they showed that they can, they can hit Israel, and Israel can't stop them from hitting Israel, which is a big change. And they, you know, there's an axis of resistance that includes Iran, Yemen, uh, Syria, um, militia gro groups in uh, Iraq, and of course Hezbollah, uh, and and there may be others too, other forces as well, but. They, they are, they are an, an alliance. They don't all have the same interests, and they don't all, you know, but um, there's, there's a big change that's happening that, uh, that's, that's underway where uh, other forces have weighed in. If it's in a limited way, I mean, Yemen and the shipping to Israel, Hezbollah, you know, the northern part of Israel is evacuated right now. Um, and it has been evacuated for quite some time. Um, and you know, and Hezbollah has been demonstrating, the people are following it, they've been demonstrating a, a, a higher level of techno, uh, technological development of weaponry and have hit Israel on a number of occasions. So those aren't decisive elements uh, in what's happening, but um, it's clear that the times have changed. I mean, how are you going to turn back that, you know, these developments that have already happened? So, right now, the, the extreme brutality of the, uh, of what is just this genocidal campaign, they're going to investigate what happened in Rafa. They're always investigating and nothing ever happens. Because the, the, this is all deliberate. And the idea is that it's not deliberate, it's just, you know, for, that's just for popular consumption in the U.S. Okay, um, so there are all the, um, there's all the questions I have right now um, in my hand. Does anyone else have any any questions? Feel free to raise your hand. Or if people want to make comments. Yeah, yeah. If people want to make comments too. Um, I'm Earlier, you were talking about the type of imperialist language that's used to kind of create this narrative around what's going on. What specific types of imperialist language do you see being used? Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, the terrorism, you know, like everybody, like the, the, the Israeli government, like, and their supporters, they, they, they refer, I was, when I was coming there, I heard them refer to all the Palestinians as terrorists who are in prison. And, and, and uh, I mean, there's so much. Like, if you just think, if you hear on the new, on the news broadcast that they say, a gunman, you know, a gunman, well, that doesn't mean a man with a gun. It means a man with a gun we don't like, right? I mean, it, the soldiers are gunmen too. They're carrying guns, but they, there's so much language. There's so much language that um, is used to prejudice people, and uh, and that you know, in in a that kind of a direction. And the, I mean, even some of the words like Haaretz, which is the liberal Israeli news source, uh, and it is worth you know reading because it has a lot of uh, information in it, but. They uh, would always, in, 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 at the height of the bombing of Gaza, you could only use, the, you couldn't use, they couldn't use the word brutal about the bombing. It was brutal was reserved for what happened on October 7th. You know, and, 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 that's, and that's the way it is. There's like, the certain adjectives, you know, cannot, can only be used against one group of people. No matter what the other group is doing, no matter what the U.S. is doing, no matter what the Israelis are doing. So I think there's there's a lot of it, and it's just I I think it's 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 worthwhile to think about some because uh, and and to explain to other people about it about like you know when you hear this the, the, the reports when you hear the news reports 
and the prejudicial way in which the wording is used. But that's all important. It's an important way of, of shaping uh, consciousness, like, you know, Israel's the only democracy in the Middle East. You know, I mean, they can have an apartheid system, but they're still somehow a democracy. Uh, but, you know, all, so much like that. Elaine? Yeah, I have a brief comment that will kind of lead into a, a bigger question that maybe you can hopefully elaborate on. So you were just talking about the different resistance groups in the Middle East, and you know, I think in the American media, we hear the names all the time of Hezbollah, of the Ansarullah, or the Houthis is what they call the media here, of you know, militias in Iraq and Syria. Um, and there's, you know, we constantly hear the names of these groups invoked and like sort of referred to as terrorist groups, uh, but we never hear in the media like a discussion of where these groups come from and what they have in common, why they're allied with each other. Um, like for example, you know, really the sort of the defining feature of all these groups and how they came into being was in response to imperialism. And so, you know, the, the Houthis in, in Yemen have sort of come out as the leadership of Yemen following like a 12 year long uh, war on Yemen by the Saudi Arabia funded by the United States. Uh, the Hezbollah, like you, like you mentioned in your talk, came into being as sort of a, the merging of these different resistance groups that were fighting against Israel when Israel was occupying the southern part of Lebanon. Uh, the militias in Iraq exist because they were the, sort of on the front lines fighting back against the United States and later ISIS when, uh, you know, during the Iraq war and then sort of the second phase of the Iraq war in the 2010s. Um, and so, uh, you know, actually all of these groups, where they come from is in a response to U.S. imperialism. And the reason that the, you know, so, something that kind of sustains the groups fighting on the front lines in Gaza or Hezbollah in the north of Israel is that there's sort of this connected land bridge of all these different resistance groups across the northern part of the Middle East that are able to send weapons and people back and forth and sort of sustain their resistance in that way. So I was hoping you could kind of elaborate a little bit more and maybe draw it out to an even, like even broader context. Like why is it important that we understand the geopolitical context of the Middle East and of the world when we're talking about um, you know, Israel and Palestine? And why is it important to sort of center anti-imperialism as like the, you know, something that brings all of these groups together that are fighting for Palestine? Yeah, I mean, a lot. I agree with what you're saying, and and I, I think that the in regard to Hezbollah, for instance, I mean, I I, I went to Lebanon uh, three times, and I went to the south where they, you know, they had a the, the, they had a, a what's called the South Liberation Army, the SLA. And the SLA were, it was really a fascist collaborators with Israel. And they, they, and they had a, a prison camp there, which was a torture camp. Um, and they, you could still see like some of the stuff that was used to torture people up there. So, I mean, it's, a, it's outrageous. It's like reality turned on its head. Uh, and, and we need to try to turn it back upside right. And, you know, the, the whole idea, like Hezbollah became terrorists because they drove the, the Israelis out of, uh, out of Lebanon, out of their, their country. I mean, it's just so outrageous, the, the, the terminology that's used. But there is a real change. I mean, when you talk about the, the Houthis in particular, who really are now the government of most of Yemen, not the, not the whole thing, but most of Yemen, and they fought this war, uh, and they defeated Saudi Arabia. They defeated Saudi Arabia. Had to sue for peace. They they had to stop. They had to, this is not that was not working for them. And then you know it's kind of I was sort of surprised. I remember seeing this as that uh, the Houthis were presented the Houthi militias. And then I saw a picture of their army, which was huge, and they were wearing you know regular uniforms and they were you know I mean like. They became, in the, in the course of the struggle against Saudi Arabia and the U.S., because it was a U.S.-Saudi, uh, UAE war against them, they defeated them. They, they, I mean, that's a really pretty remarkable, uh, given the poverty of, of Yemen and its isolation and all that, and the different factions that are there, but they did. So uh, it's, it's, uh, 
And it's important for us to, under, to, to really have, I mean, without an anti-imperialist view, none of this is understandable. You can't make sense of it. But starting with an anti-imperialist point of view, from, an, a, 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 that, per, from that perspective, uh, we can understand what's really going on. And I think understand it correctly. So like, you have people who are telling us, some leftists who are telling us, we have to, you have to uh, criticize Hamas too. It's like, well, you know, you're in the center of world imperialism. You're in the center of US imperialism. No, I don't think that's really what's on our agenda right now. Uh, and if you have it, uh, you know, that, that, that need to compromise for some reason, um, we don't share. And, and I, I think having that view, I mean, it's, it's been, the, you know, we, we went through a lot, the Answer Coalition, and we're, I'll just say a little bit about it. The Answer Coalition came into being three days after September 11, 2001. Uh, we formed it in Washington with a few people we contacted other organizations. They weren't big organizations, but we thought that, and they joined together and we, we formed this coalition. And then the big, big issue became in the, in the uh, run up to the 2003 invasion, of, that criminal invasion of Iraq, was are you gonna talk about Palestine? Is, there gonna, is Palestine gonna be included in, in the, in the anti-war movement? And there was a split in the anti-war movement over that. So there's a big struggle over, there was a big struggle over whether or not we should just say, which many, many people told us, just talk about Iraq, don't talk about Palestine. Well, and we said, no, we're not gonna do that anymore. We're not, we're not gonna, uh, you know, because it makes some Democrat unhappy. <laughs> about, which is really what it's about. Uh, you know, that uh, here's an occupation that's been going on since 1948, and it's like a few hundred miles away from the new occupation that's going on. And, you know, we're just not going to do that. I mean, that's a rejection, actually a rejection of an anti-imperialist viewpoint. And then it was the same thing with, like, you know, you know, the demonization that always happens with the leaders of these other countries, you know, like this extreme demonization, which is, which also gets, has gotten bought into by the liberals. We go, oh, we have to criticize them too. No, that's not what our responsibility is living in the United States. Our responsibility is to, uh, is to expose. I mean, we can, people can write anything that they want to, but what's really critical is to have a thoroughgoing anti-imperialist point of view. That's the only way to understand what's going on. And it's also the only way to understand where we really stand. So, uh, this is something that's, you know, it's been a big, and, you know, in the first Iraq war, which was such a, uh, there was just a, such criminal wars, and uh, the, um, in that war, the liberal wing of the anti-war movement said sanctions, not war. And we said, no, sanctions are war, and it was proven by, of course, what happened there, although, Ramsey Clark, the former U.S. Attorney General who we worked with at that time, had said more damage was done after to the Vietnamese by sanctions than was actually done during the war. It was so terrible. The next time around, so, you know, 10 years later, everybody knew it was sanctions, a million and a half Iraqis dead from sanctions, half of them children. So now, in the second one, the, the liberal wing said, weapons inspections, not war. <laughs> And so, well, you know, we kind of asked them, well, do you think they might falsify that report? <laughs> <laughs> Could it possibly be conceivable? Yeah. No, you're against the war. And the, these, the things that take us away from the anti-imperialist mm -hmm. point of view are the things that are done to, to placate the, uh, the liberal wing of the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. in reality. The anti-war wing, which has to, maintain its respectability by denouncing the leaders of the other countries or calling for weapons inspections or calling for sanctions instead of just saying no to the war. We, don't, we didn't like go to it, we didn't have really radical slogans. Our slogans were, you know, no war, no occupation, money for people's needs, not for war. But we're not gonna say, as we were advised by so many people, we're not gonna condemn the leaders of other countries who are, being, who are now Any other questions?
question. Derek? Yeah, well just, and speaking about the sort of like the language, I remember in college, uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was the president of Iran, and he was only called a dictator. Mm -hmm. And then his two terms were up, and he did seek re-election. Well, you know, it's like a dictator. Dictator, I, the, all the papers, it was only dictator, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and the, I think that the demonization is, can be very hard to stand up to because it's so, you know, widespread. I mean, you think about the Libyan war and the, you know, Gaddafi had been demonized for, you know, decades. And it was very, if you were to say, well, we should, like, not bomb Libya, you know, like, oh, well, you know, like, okay, the apologist and, you know, whatever, or Saddam mm -hmm. Hussein or, you know, whoever it is. So, do you think that it's getting easier to sort of win people over to that argument? Like, look at, you know, Nat Turner, like, we celebrate Nat Turner's insurrection, it's like, you know, like a, a heroic thing. You know, I mean, he killed, like, a family, right? I mean, you know, like, I mean, a child, right? Too. I mean, it doesn't mean that, like, I support every single thing that every, you know, like, uh, you know, Northern, you know, uh, Union soldier did during the war, but, like, I support the Northern. Um, so do you think that that's getting easier in those periods of isolation, like with Libya and with Syria, are they kind of like coming to fruition now? You know, like we've seen the gains from that sort of being principled and like refusing to condemn these, you know, uh, leaders of oppressed nations. Yeah. Well, I think that society is becoming polarized. It's becoming much more polarized. So. And uh, there's the right wing polar right wing side of it, and there's a the left wing side of it. And I think that, I'm, uh, that and that the, it, you can just see by the conference in Detroit. I mean, that was unlike any conference I've ever attended before. Is that you know, there's just thousands of people who came together, and they were only representing a small fraction of the movement that's emerged. And the movement is anti-imperialist. It's anti-imperialist. It's and it's against the system. So that 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 voice has gotten stronger, but, and, and and because it's stronger, you know it, it attracts people, and uh, we need to attract more people. We need to attract the you know we, what the government is really worried about. I think the, is they're worried about what's happening inside of the United States. And like uh, they're I'm sure working over time trying to figure out how they're going to defeat the this movement. Um, but um, I, and so I, in that sense, it is easier because you know that's when it, when it's when that, those voices are stronger, they're more persuasive. I mean, a lot of people, and and also the the fact that you know what, what really the great educator in in life is the struggle itself. It's the great educator because it's I mean, and I can speak from my own personal experience about like how actually going to a demonstration, going to a demonstration, when people go to a protest, they, they're not really the same afterwards. They might have not thought of themselves, it's like for like one day, uh, you know, are you a protester? No, I'm not a protester. And then something happens and you go to a protest and then you are a protester. <laughs> and once you become a protester, you start to, and once you, once you have a, a, a difference with one, aspect of the system. And you say, you know, someone goes through an experience and they say, that's not true. You know, either something that happened to them or they went on strike or, you know, they participated in an action and the police accused them of beating the police. You know, the mm -hmm. usual yeah. thing that happens in the demonstration. <laughs> but the police, uh, they, get, they have boo-boos and, you know. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, like, but, but it does really change people, and it opens people up to change. And, and, and by, by actually entering into the struggle. So that's one of the things that I think about, like what we need to do is figure out the ways to reach out to more people, particularly young people, but not exclusively. More to poor people, people who are struggling economically now, and to make the connections uh, between what's happening in Palestine and what's happening here. But I think to open the way for millions more people to enter into progressive political activism 
I can't think of anything that would be more important than that. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so speaking on that, for people who in essence agree with like the socialist policies and anti-imperialist policies, but yet they're so like bogged down by um, propaganda to the point where they're they they say and they say they believe in say like right wing or even leftist views, but yet when you ask them a question, like oh, they agree with the, the policies of the, the social party or you know, anti-imperialism, how do you, what's, what's your idea of like a good way to, um, how, how do their minds stay open? I mean, I, I think it's like there's so many different ways that they can, that can actually happen. Um, I mean, one thing I, is that <clears throat> I believe you can't really, you can't make people interested in something if they're not interested in it. You know, and you can't, uh, uh, you, you can't get them to, to be different than they are. I mean, when we go out and we hand out like a thousand flyers or something, and you know, we expect that a few people will respond to it or may respond to it. Um, but that, that's, that's the, you know, that can be the beginning for them, for that person. I mean, one flyer can be the beginning for the people. Uh, it can be like when they, you know, they, they got this flyer and they went to a meeting. They got this flyer and they went to an art build. I mean, we were having like masses of people that, our office in San Francisco burned last September. We had a 5,000 square foot office, two floors, and, and we got pushed into it. We had to go into a, a 650 square foot rather than 5,000 square foot. And we have a big, <laughs> pretty big organization. So, And that organization, when this started, the art builds were just pouring out of the doors. And then there was, you know, and those activities, that can be the activity. So it's like someone comes to an art show and they paint a sign, you know, they paint something or, you know, and then they go to the demonstration and then, you know, this whole process. So I think that um, however we can, like I said, we don't want to be too repetitive, but I think that however we can figure out the ways and the experimental ways to bring people into activism, they don't have to start off be being socialist revolutionaries, uh, you know. And, and some people will, and some people won't. Uh, but in building a, in building a movement, I think the, the thing is to you know have the optimism that <clears throat> if we reach people and if they become active and they become involved, you know, this is this is the way that, that life really changes. And for a lot of people, uh, it really is that they. The, something happens. I remember, like, there was a 13-year-old boy who was shot by the sheriff in Sonoma County, a Latino boy, and, and Andy Lopez, and he, um, <clears throat> and that was an example. And, and his school, which is a mostly Latino school in Santa Rosa, California, like the whole student body came out and marched in protest, and they were the ones who I was thinking of at that time. It's like. Wow, if you asked, I had asked most of them the uh, day before, are you a protester? They probably would have felt a little weary about who you were, why you were asking them that. <laughs> but then the next day they became protesters. You know, and, and it's, 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 it's and, and you look at, look at like some of the episodes that have been like the George Floyd protests were unbelievable. And the, the New York Times, I, I think, said 29, 29 million people participated in protests at that time. The FBI went into small towns. The FBI dispatched people into small towns to try to intimidate people. Why are you protesting? I mean, you know. But, um, you know, and, and then there's all the things that are so unpredictable that we just don't know. We don't know what's coming. We're in the middle of a historical process, and you can only understand the historical process from the from the future looking back. But we have to assume that, you know, more and more people are open and will be open to having a view that's anti-imperialist, but also having a, like a, a class view. 
that like, you know, there are, we're not all middle class or underclass, that horrible term, <laughs> or, uh, you know, or, or rich. You know, there's actually a working class that makes society run. So there's all kinds of opportunities for, for, uh, for explanation and reaching people in all different ways to reach people. Something.